For the past uh, seven weeks, we have been studying chapter by chapter through 1 Samuel. And each week, I've tried to remind you of the background to the book, kind of what's going on at this time. And I've done that each week by quoting for you uh, the very last verse of the book of Judges. I've done it each week, so let's see how well you've paid attention, all right? See if you can finish this. Every man did what was right. Well, you guys listen better than my kids do. Wonderful. That's very good. Well, what I have not quoted to you is the first half of that verse, which is also part of the background. And it says this, quote, In those days there was no king. In Israel. We've been looking at the small stories of 1 Samuel now for, for seven chapters. But today in chapter 8, we come back to the big story of 1 Samuel. Because in a big sense, what this book shows us is how Israel went from anarchy to monarchy. So practically speaking, what that means is for seven weeks, we've covered seven chapters and we've only finished the introduction for the book. This is the chapter we've been waiting for. This is the chapter Samuel's been building towards. This is the chapter that we were being prepared for. 1 Samuel 8 is all about Israel's demand. That is their demand for a king. And it's this moment, it's this event, It's this turning point that's going to set the nation on a new trajectory and usher in a new era for the people of God. This is an interesting chapter for many reasons. It's been read and applied in many different ways throughout history. For instance, two of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine, Both cited this chapter as why America should not have a monarchy. In his famous work, Common Sense, Thomas Paine wrote this, quote, For the will of the Almighty, as declared by Samuel, expressly disapproves of government by kings. Well, with all due respect to Jefferson and Paine, I don't think that's entirely accurate. But you can see why they they read that, because this chapter is is a really interesting text. And it's very tempting, not just for them, but for all of us, to to read this chapter and only see what's on the surface. We, We can see what's in the foreground, but miss what's in the background. Yeah, on the surface, this is about Israel's demand. But the real issue here is not Israel's demand for a king. It is Israel's discontentment with God. That's the real issue. It's not so much a government issue as it is a heart issue. And let's be honest, sometimes we struggle with that same temptation. That our hearts want to come to God and And we see our problems, our issues, our challenges. And sometimes we want to say, God, you need to change that. 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 When in reality, what he may need to change is this. That it's something inside of us that is leading us astray. The message that's coming out of Israel's heart is loud and clear, and the message that they're proclaiming to Samuel and to God and to us in this passage is that God is not enough. Does your heart ever try to tell you that? Your desires try to tell you that? Are your prayers sometimes reshaped because you've got to have something else? All of our hearts sometimes are tempted with discontentment in God. And this passage is instructive to every one of us. And may the Lord deliver us 
from being discontent with him. If you were here last week, you know that chapter 7 was a banner moment for Israel. They repented to God, they relied on God, and they were delivered by God. And through it all, Samuel's ministry was established in Israel. We ended last week at the end of the chapter. It says that year by year and town by town, Samuel ministered. He was their prophet, he was their priest, and he was their judge. And that sets up then where we come to this key chapter, chapter 8, verse 1. Notice it says, And it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. I was reading this passage with my family this week, and I pointed out that the elders come to Samuel and say, Behold, you're old. And one of my boys said, Rude. <laughs> well, I don't know if they're being rude or not, but... But th this is the truth. Samuel's got a little more gray hair. Samuel's walking a little bit slower from town to town. Samuel's pausing a little bit more as he does his work as judge. Some scholars think that as many as 30 to possibly 50 years have passed between the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. In fact, it's enough time for him now to have grown sons. And that's important to remember because the dramatic events of chapter 7 that we just studied last week are now way in the past. Let's be honest, some of the people who, who were there that day, who heard the magnificent thunderclap of God confuse the Philistines, many of them are now dead. And now there's a whole generation who maybe weren't even alive when chapter 7 happened. D.A. Carson says, what one generation assumes, the next generation abandons. That may be what's happening here. Oh, they assumed we saw what God did, but they didn't pass that down to their children. And so now they're in a generation that thinks differently. The aging Samuel appoints his own sons to take his place. Their names, verse 2, are Joel and Abijah. This godly father gives godly names and godly offices to these boys in the hopes that they would do it in a godly fashion. But verse 3, we learn that, quote, his sons did not walk in his ways. Samuel had a good reputation, but his sons did not. Samuel was known for his honesty, his integrity, and his piety. But his sons were not. So here we have an example of a, a clear example of a godly father with ungodly sons. You know, I thought about that a lot this week because you've all seen it. Maybe some have experienced it. There is nothing more heartbreaking for Christian parents than to see their children stray from the example they've set for them. Maybe it's when you hear your 10-year-old tell a bold-faced lie. You see your teenager hanging out with the wrong crowd. You, you see your adult children move away and then drift away from the things of God. And, and what do many Christian parents do? We start to take it personally. We think, well, maybe I was too hard on them. Maybe I was too soft on them. Maybe we didn't have enough Bible studies. Maybe we had too many Bible studies. Listen, godly Children are not a reward, they are a blessing. Yes, parents, you have a responsibility, but your children also have a responsibility. Rebellious children are not a referendum on faithful parents. You can take them to Jesus, but you can't make them love Jesus. And so even if your kids are unfaithful, even if they stray, parents, you remain faithful. Stick with what the Lord has called you to do. His sons, notice verse 3, they did some evil things. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes and they perverted justice. It's almost like, you know, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, when we see that they wanted this money, 
our mind should instantly go back and think of another set of sons. Remember them? Right? We, we have seen Hophni and Phineas. They wanted stakes and skirts. Joel and Abijah just want cold, hard cash. And in both cases, we see leaders who are in positions of authority that abuse it for their own satisfaction. Well, there's nothing new under the sun, is there? We still see it in our day. People in positions of power who abuse it and misuse it for their own selves. By the way, you can tell a lot about a person based on how they handle money and food and sex. You should not put a man in control of others if he cannot control his own appetites. This is especially true for those who lead God's people. Those who lead must be an example of self-control. We prayed this morning for our elders, and I praise God for these men that the Lord has raised up in our midst. I've said before in the coming months and weeks, we're going to be looking for some new elders for those rotating off and new deacons to serve in our church. Let's remember the New Testament says both elders and deacons must not be addicted to wine. They must not be lovers of money, and they should be faithful to their spouse. Intemperate men are unqualified men. And we should start to pray now as a congregation that when the time comes that he would raise up godly leaders, those who can be an example to us in these things. Trust me, we don't want Hophni's. We don't want Phineas's. We don't want Abijah's. I was going to say we don't want Joel's, but we have a really good deacon named Joel, and we want him, so <laughs> we're not... We want that Joel, not this. Okay, not this Joel, okay. But qualified men are necessary, and these men weren't. And notice to their credit, the elders of Israel recognized his issues. Verse 5, behold, you've grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. They wisely pass on Samuel's sons. But get this, in order to expose the one problem, they propose a solution that creates an even bigger problem. They say, now appoint a king for us to judge us. To use kind of a modern phrase, they want to trade the devils they know for the devil they don't know. Israel had never had a king. They tried to make Gideon king, but he wisely said no. And so they say, they demand, appoint a king for us. Now the million dollar question of this chapter that everybody wants to know is, was this wrong? Was it bad for Israel to ask for a king? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. And that tension is clearly present in this chapter. If you read the text this week, did you find yourself going, ooh, I don't know how I, how I like this. You know, I, I don't know how I should feel. If you didn't know how you should feel, that's exactly how you're supposed to feel. This chapter, it's, it's like Samuel's against it, but then he's going to do it. And God doesn't like it, but then he says, why do I feel that way? Because there is a sense in which the answer is yes and no. And let me briefly explain both. Well, why is the answer no, it was not wrong for them? Because God anticipated this for the nation. I almost never do this, so if I do, it's important. Keep a finger in 1 Samuel and turn back with me to the book of Deuteronomy. And I want you to see Deuteronomy chapter 17. As you're turning to Deuteronomy chapter 17... This is 400 years earlier. And Moses has given to the people the second giving of the law, Deuteronomy, and you can almost think of it like Israel's constitution. Right? And so he gives to them the, their governance, their laws, their stipulations. And in Deuteronomy 17, notice this very interesting clause, if you will, in their constitution. Verse 14. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, you shall say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. And you shall surely set a king over you, whom, dot, dot, dot. Now we're going to get to the rest in a second, but notice, God clearly predicts this. And not only does he predict it, he gives provisions for it. He doesn't command it. 
but he does seem to give, he seems to regulate it, knowing this would be where they would go, and he wants to be sure if you're going to do this, you're going to do it right. And so if God gives those kinds of regulations, it could not be a, an outright sin for them to do. So in that sense, no, it was not wrong. But in other sense, the other tension is that, yes, something was wrong. Because why? Because they say, appoint a king like all the nation. It was not wrong to want a king. I think it was wrong to want this kind of king. You see, God's plan for Israel, watch this, was missional. We don't think of it that way, but think about it this way. Their plan was to be missional. And so Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. They were not supposed to be like the nations. And so they had distinct laws, they had distinct diets, they had distinct dress, and they were supposed to have very distinct kings if and when they get one. You say, how do I know that was the case? Because look at those stipulations if you're still in Deuteronomy. Verse 15, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your countrymen. Look at verse 16, he shall not multiply horses for himself. 17, he shall not multiply wives. At the end of 17, he will great, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Then watch 18. Now it will come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of Deuteronomy. And it shall be with him, verse 19, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of the law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he might not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, do you remember those cows a couple of weeks ago? Oh, this is all wrapped up into this. So that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. All right, you can turn back to 1 Samuel. You say, Pastor, what does all that mean? I'll, I'll give it to you in a sentence. This is the best way I can describe what I think is happening here. It was not wrong to ask for an earthly king it was wrong to ask for a worldly king. You see the difference? It was not wrong to have an earthly king. In fact, the irony is, if they had followed Deuteronomy 17, they could have had the best of both worlds. God says, if you have a king, make sure he's a king like meets these qualifications. And if he had met those qualifications, they would have had a man as king and also had God as king. Because that man was supposed to spend his time copying and reading and knowing Deuteronomy and following those things and saying, hey, y'all follow me as I follow God. And therefore, they could have had both a man as king and God as king. But that's not what they asked for. Basically, as we will see in this chapter, Israel, if I can say it this way, is sort of tired of being Israel. They're tired of being distinct from their neighbors. They're tired of being the oddballs in the culture. They desperately wanted to fit in. They want to fight like the Gentiles and look like the Gentiles and act like the Gentiles. And brothers and sisters, let's be honest. This kind of worldliness is still a temptation for God's people, especially when it comes to government. When I listen to some of the political shenanigans coming out of many pulpits today, I wonder sometimes if the church is just tired of being the church. We want to look like the world and act like the world. And, and listen to me, this is, this is bigger than the question of who you vote for. See, like Israel, our heart sometimes says, we want somebody rich and powerful and strong and impressive to lead the charge. And deep down, we want them to do for us what only the Lord is supposed to do for us. We want a man to look to, a man to rely on, a man to boast in. But my friends, let him that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. But our hearts want what our hearts want. As I've studied this text all week, I have prayed over and over again, Lord, do deliver us from the idolatry of politics. Let me remind you, mental idols are more subtle than metal ones. 
And for many people, politics is becoming a mental idol. It is becoming the new religion in our nation. And even Christians get tempted like Israel. Let me ask a few questions. How much time and energy did you spend this last week reading, watching, listening to political news? Let me, let me ask you another question. Have you ever abandoned a witnessing opportunity because you just had to straighten out their politics first? Because if so, politics may become an idol. Do your conversations veer faster towards Joe Biden or Jesus Christ? When you get together and, and have dinner, is the evening dominated by the ugliness of government or the beauty of the gospel? I, I'm not saying you can't have long discussions about politics. I'm not saying these things are unimportant. In fact, they are extremely important. But my concern for the church is one of priority and identity. It is mind-blowing to me how many Christians over the last few years have proven themselves to be more loyal to their political tribe than to their local church? It's mind-blowing to me. And, and you don't have to look much further than COVID. And by the way, COVID did not create that stuff. It exposed it. It exposed what was in many people's hearts. And I fear that for many of us, Politics, it may become an idol if we let it. Yes, there is a time to win arguments, but there is also a time to win souls. And sometimes I'm worried that instead of being a light to unbelievers in our politics, we are becoming like unbelievers. Samuel sees this among the God's people, and he doesn't like it. Is it a temptation for you? Is it becoming an idol for you? I beg of you to examine your heart before Christ because you shall have no other gods before him. Israel doesn't just ask for an earthly king, they ask for a worldly king. And this ticks Samuel off, verse 6. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel. This was evil in Samuel's eyes. He is not happy about this. But notice what he does upon hearing this. Samuel prayed to the Lord. Well, what a great example for us, huh? When you see something that upsets you politically or hear something that upsets you politically, is your first impulse to get on a soapbox, to get on a keyboard, or to get on your knees? Samuel gets on his knees. I don't like what I see. I don't like what I hear, Lord, but I need you. And listen to what the Lord says in verse 7. He says, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they say to you, for they've not rejected you. They've rejected me from being king over them. How sad. The people of God rejecting the authority of God. One of the most blasphemous statements in history is the statement, we have no king but Caesar." The Lord knows that deep down, this is not about Israel's demand. This is about their discontentment with him. And brothers and sisters, let's be honest. Sometimes this creeps into our hearts. But the Lord is not enough. Yeah, 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 we have the Lord, but we need the White House. Yeah, 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 well, I, I have the Lord, but I need this job. Yeah, I have the Lord, but I need this boyfriend, this girlfriend. I need this relationship. God tells Samuel, don't take it personally, man. They've been doing this to me since Egypt. Verse 8, he says, for 400 years, they've mistreated me like this. I do something for them, and then they, they wander off and, and look for other gods. I actually wrote down in my notes this week, for 400 years, God has been in a toxic relationship with Israel. <laughs> By the way, isn't he sometimes in a toxic relationship with us? He's faithful. He's kind, he's merciful, and we're the ones. The Lord tells Samuel, do as they ask. 
But before Samuel gives them a king, God says, give them a warning. And that's verses 11 through 17. Samuel paints a picture here of what life will be like under this worldly king. Notice how verse 11 starts. He says, this will be the procedure of the king. Um, Some of your translations say the ways, others say the rights. I think for our ears, the better term is policies. These will be the policies of the king. Uh, If you know nowadays, every president, when they come in, they always have their 100-day plan. Samuel says, all right, you want a king, it's a worldly king, here's his 100-day plan. Here's what he will do. And Samuel gets down to it. Now, by the way, there's also a a play on words here because the word there in verse 11 for procedure is the same word used back in verse 3 that Samuel's sons had perverted policies. So they had messed up policies, and God is warning them up front, listen, you're trading the injustice of Samuel's sons for what's going to be an even greater injustice. At least they only did it in Beersheba. You're going to have a king over the whole nation. And his policies will not be just. What are the concerns of his policies? Samuel lays before them two warnings. He will take and he will tax. In fact, if you notice closely, even in English, he will take, 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 and take. He will take your sons. He will take your daughters. He will take your fields. He will take your seed. He will take your servants. He will take your animals. And he will use them, what, to to create a standing army. He will amass his wealth, and he will do all the things that are the exact opposite of Deuteronomy 17. He should not amass horses, well, that's what he's going to do. He should not amass wealth, but that's what he's going to do through taxation. If you look for that kind of king, then that's what you're going to get. And notice the final concern in verse 17. He says, he will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day, but the Lord will not answer you. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? You will be his servants and you will cry out to the Lord. That sounds a lot like the Exodus. That's his point. He said, you fellows didn't like being slaves in Egypt, where now you're about to be slaves in your own country. Servants to this king that you want. Servants to someone else. And he's going to take, and he's going to take, and he's going to take from you. My friend, listen to me. God offers us freedom. And when you reject his kingship, and you run after other things, you are voluntarily entering into slavery. You say, I want to follow my heart. That's like asking for handcuffs. I want to follow my whims, my desires. That's like putting on shackles. No, Jesus breaks us from all of those things and helps us to live in true freedom in him. And notice in verse 18, the emphasis, he says, you will cry out because of your king that you have chosen for yourselves. Remember Deuteronomy 17, you will appoint, if you appoint a king, it must be one the Lord chooses. But this is quite clear, they don't want that, they want a king that they choose. God's warning is simple, if you go through this and you set this person in place, just remember you guys signed up for it. And so verse 19, their response, nevertheless the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and they said no, but there shall be a king over us. Samuel must have been gobsmacked by their response. God could not have been clearer about what was best and what was in store and what they were trading things for. And yet hearing all of that, hearing God's word, hearing his prediction, they still rejected the wisdom of this plan. Let's be honest. Discontentment with God makes us incredibly short-sighted, doesn't it? We don't stop and think about the future. We don't think about the consequences. We don't think about what lies ahead. We want what we want, and we want it now. I told my kids there's a great lesson in this. I'm a firm believer that education is preferable to ignorance. I preach that to my kids all the time. Knowing stuff is better than not knowing stuff. 
even if you don't agree with the stuff. But I'm also a firm believer that education is not the same thing as wisdom. How do I know? Israel is now more educated than they were at the start of the chapter, but they're just as foolish. They've got information, but there's no transformation. Brothers and sisters, it is not enough to hear the truth. It is not enough to know the truth. We must love the truth. We must walk in the truth. We must obey the truth. Checking the list of all the Bible verses may make you smart, but it does not necessarily make you wise. Wisdom is putting it into action in your response to God and the choices you make. And Israel is being foolish in rejecting God as their king. But that's what happens when you're discontent, because discontentment not only makes you short-sighted, it also makes you stubborn. I want what I want. You can listen, you can read Bible verses all day long. I, I, I still want this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to chase this. I, I need to get revenge on that person. I need a little more money to, to get to this stage. And so often it, we, we dig in our heels when we're discontent with God. Despite all this, Israel doesn't back down. In fact, they double down, verse 20. Give us a king that we may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and what? Fight our battles. Talk about a slap in the face of God. What just happened in chapter 7? Even though a lot of time has passed, the author clearly puts these events side by side so we read them together. And the message is loud and clear. God had delivered them. God didn't need an army. God didn't need soldiers. God didn't need swords. God could defeat the Philistines with a sound. He could confuse them with a thunderclap. But Israel doesn't find security in that. They don't find that satisfying. Oh, they need something more. We don't like this invisible king. We want a visible king. And our hearts are so often tempted to look for security in in tangible things, invisible things. Israel craves to be intimidating. They crave to have military might. They crave to have that so they can look like the nations. But my friends, God's people should not find security in anything but the Lord. Samuel tells God, here's what the people said. And so verse 22, the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. I think what's interesting here is that God gives them approval. Despite his warnings, despite his advice. Again, Deuteronomy, God knew this was coming. But in the end, what happens? God is actually the one who takes control of the situation and he's the one that establishes the monarchy. God's the one who green lights the plan. God's the one who's going to set up this throne. And he will at first, yes, give them the kind of king they want. And guess what? Nobody's going to benefit. That starts next week in chapter 9. Samuel tells them that you've made an unwise decision and yet they still want to do it. Listen to me closely. One of the worst things that can happen to you is to hear and know God's word and his clear plan, and to reject it, and to refuse it, and to ignore it, and one day for you to wake up, and for God to say, you know what, fine. You can have it. It reminds me of Romans chapter 1. I wish I had time to talk about this. We have creation, we have our conscience, and we know all this about who God is, his invisible attributes have been seen since the very beginning, but what do men do? We, we who think who are wise are actually fools. Even though we're educated in these things and we have the truth, we suppress the truth and unrighteousness, we turn our back on him, we worship creation, and then what does God do? He says, you know what? You can have it. He turns you over to a depraved mind. He turns people over to their depraved desires. And God says, go ahead. It's a horrifying thing for God ever to do to a nation or to anyone. 
As I said, I don't think it's wrong for Israel to want a king. I think it was wrong to want this kind of king. If I did my math correctly, over its history from here forward, Israel will have 42 kings in total. And only seven will do what's right in the eyes of God. Now think about those odds. For a thousand years, they will have king after king after king after king. You know what they'll do? They'll take and tax and take and tax and take and tax. They won't study Deuteronomy. They don't do what God says. They will take and tax and take and tax, and it will lead them further and further away from God. Bad king after bad king after bad king. But if you back up and continue tracing the history of Israel, we know that while Israel is stubborn, God is merciful. Because God's answer to bad kings is not no king, it's the right king. Deuteronomy 17 said, you can have God as king and a man as king. But what you need is you need a man who doesn't abolish the law, but a man who fulfills the law. You don't need a a man who, who loves himself and loves his army and loves his money, but a man who loves the Lord with all of his heart. You don't need a man who obeys his own impulses, but a man who obeys God perfectly in all things. And brothers and sisters, that's what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we have? We have God and man as the perfect king. And King Jesus is God's king for you and me. And listen to me, if you don't know him today, my friend, listen to me, I beg of you, I beg of you to turn to him. He said, but I don't like the idea of somebody being in charge of me, somebody being a king. Well, I can understand that in a a selfish way, but listen to me. Unlike worldly kings and worldly bosses, Jesus does not take and take and take and take. He gives and gives and gives. In fact, if he's going to take anything, it's not your sons. He will take your sins. That's what he did at the cross. He doesn't send us out to fight battles for him. He goes out and he dies for us. And he goes to the cross bearing our shame, bearing our guilt, knowing our idolatrous hearts, and yet he still cries out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what we do. And when he hears us being veered over to worshiping our idols, he says from from, from the throne, Father, forgive them. He intercedes for us. My friend, if you don't know him, Jesus is here not to take from you, but to give you eternal life, to give you forgiveness, to give you salvation, to make you a co-heir with him so that you can be brought into his kingdom. Is Jesus your king? He won't lead you to the right or lead you to the left. He will lead you into his kingdom. And my friends, when Jesus is king of your heart and your mind, listen to me, as as now as children of God, that doesn't mean we all of a sudden stop doing politics. Don't misunderstand me. It just means we now start doing politics to the glory of God. So that now we don't hate our enemies. We love our enemies. We don't pray Excuse me, we don't don't hate those. We pray for those that might persecute us. And we start to engage the political realms and the people around us even the way that the Lord Jesus did. My friends, what are the idols in your life? Maybe you're 99% content with God, but that 1% is going to get you in trouble. My friends, I beg of you, where in your heart are you discontent with God? That your heart cries out, I need this, I need this, and confess that so that the Lord can change your heart to say, I need you. Because my friends, there is no one and nothing more satisfying than the kingdom of God, and that's because there is no one more satisfying than King Jesus himself. Will you trust him? Brothers and sisters, will you look to him? And will we shed 
the discontentment that this world tries to bait us into and give our hearts and devotions fully to him.